All right, the time finally has come and I'm making a review on the beloved Canon C70. I've had this camera for about six months and I have a love and hate relationship that came through some software updates actually. And as you know, I've been meaning to make this review as long as I have this camera, but finally I think it's the best time and the right time to make this review as I have enough experience and time that I have spent with this camera on various projects such as documentaries, also high-end production shoots, short video commercials, lots of fun stuff actually. To get this out of the way, first of all, I came from using Canon R5. I've been always a Canon shooter and I'm very used to Canon menus and all the ergonomics that Canon provides. I also like Canon Color Science and I've been always a fan of Canon C-Log3 and now C-Log2 because I'm getting better dynamic range. So having the R5 and the R and R6 Mark II right now as well, I've been wanting to try out the cinema camera from Canon and the C70 was the first thing that came into my mind. Now I also did a huge research before I was buying. I considered many other options such as Sony FX3, Red Komodo, autofocus wasn't that good. Sony, I'm not a fan of Sony. I don't know. And I'm not just a fan of some of the things that Sony provides, but that's not what we're talking about in this video. Maybe sometime in the future. My first biggest concern about this camera was autofocus. There have been times when it was, was bad and there have been times it's good, but since the new update, it's actually gotten a lot better. But let me tell you that in the later in this video. All right, but let's break down this video into some parts and pieces. I made the little list that I will be covering in this video. So if at any point you get bored of listening to me, you can just watch YouTube chapters that you can click and scroll. And this camera body is very similar to 1DX series. It's pretty much huge DSLR body, but it's also bulkier and since the fan sticks out in the back. Once you rig it up and you can watch my video here somewhere, um, this camera can get pretty big, but it helps you along the way and, and the bigger and heavier the camera is, it's actually easier to handle and there's a lot less micro jitters in your movement. And for documentary style shooting, it's pretty great to rig up your camera and make it a little bit bulkier to carry it like this and handle it. And actual video uh, movements become actually more pleasing to the eye. But you can also set it up on the gimbal. I love using it with the RS2 Pro and it fits just perfect again in this video right here. If you are a Canon shooter, you will be very familiar with the menus unless you have never tried cinema camera. Cinema camera menus are a lot different from Canon mirrorless camera lineup. And you would be surprised uh, as I was at first that some of the touch screen features on the monitor are not working as good as on the mirrorless cameras you are used to, such as R, R5, R6 and so, and so on. Yeah, you will be prompt to be using actual physical buttons more than the touch screen because for some reason some like half of the things on this camera are like disabled and you won't be able to touch on actual physical screen. You will have to scroll through the menus and pick your things out there. The menus are also a lot bigger, um, not familiar in a way, but you get used to it pretty quickly. Build quality. Build quality is great other than some things. You have probably heard of the monitor on this camera not being that good. I've heard that the first generation are even worse. Mine I've purchased, like I said, about six months ago, so it shouldn't be the worst, worst quality, but I wouldn't say it's great. Um, the flippy screen just wobbles. Like you would open it and it just wobbles and it has like movement. And I'm just actually scared to touch it a lot because I feel like I'm gonna break it. It just like feels like not Canon made it because all the other Canon cameras like mirrorless cameras the flipper screen is just great. It clicks in, it closes, it opens, it's stiff. This screen is just another story. I don't know. Mine is not broken, fingers crossed, yet. <laughs> Hopefully I won't, but I'm trying to use more of the Ninja that I have unless I'm using the gimbal. Actually on the gimbal, I've been flying the Ninja as well on top with a small rig handle. It becomes pretty easy. Other than that, the build quality is great. The concerning thing is the holes on the fans. I haven't got it very wet yet like some of my other cameras, but um, it's pretty weather resistant. I would say and the body is really robust. Now, some of the things that I don't like about this camera, the startup time is pretty long. I would say it's about three, maybe even more seconds. I'm used to having the camera to turn on and right away you can run and gun, but no, you will have to wait for a good three seconds so you can miss the moment. But there is a cool feature that this camera has. It's pre-recorded and you can set up, for example, to two seconds, which means once you turn on the camera, press the button, it will actually start recording two seconds ago, back in time. But the downside of this feature is that the battery is always running because the camera is running in the back pretty much on standby, even though it's off. Pretty surprised that Canon R6 Mark II, the review is coming up, it also has this feature, which is pretty sick. You will never lose the moment with feature like that, but you will be draining your camera battery a little bit more, I would say. Overheating, this camera does not overheat. I haven't got it to overheat. I never had it to overheat. 
I don't know. Um, if somebody got it to overheat, let me know in the comments below. This camera also takes two SD cards. I actually kind of like the SD cards because I'm used to the system, opposed to Canon R5 taking these big cards right here. But they are faster, I believe. They are a lot more faster when I dump down all my footage uh, into the computer. Using some of the codecs on the Canon C70, especially the newer codecs, even 10 bit, it takes a lot less space on the memory card than the Canon R5 similar footage size because I believe the camera uses in different codecs and the list of codecs on this camera is just huge. I also love how Canon throughout the last six months been coming out with the software updates. First they released internal RAW which to some people was a big deal because how do you have a cinema camera that does not record RAW? Yeah it does give you a little bit you would have to have a really good eye to see better dynamic range and of course, you'll be able to slide all your sliders in DaVinci. But to me, I have not been using RAW because it just takes a lot more time for me and the files are bigger and I don't see a huge benefit. But it's a nice thing to have. Talking about software update, the last and latest software update that this camera had was the slow motion autofocus. Until now, 4K 120 had phase detection autofocus, which means it was not detecting phase or eye at all. Now they finally added phase detection, eye detection, and as well eye detection in regular 4K 24, 30, 60 frames per second. This is a big deal because before it would not detect eye or face in slow-mo at all. And to be honest, the slow-mo autofocus was bad. Like 50% of the time it was focusing on something else. Unless there is a really good contrast, for example, blue beach water background and somebody wearing black hoodie up front, it will probably focus on the black hoodie unless you you couldn't even like actually touch on the screen to pick the area where for the camera to focus now you can finally touch in slow-mo which is pretty great and i'm super excited that canon actually did it in software update even though the autofocus did get better i would say in low light it still is not as good as something like r5 or r6 as long as the light is good you will get great autofocus but as as soon as it gets darker the autofocus is just not on par with Canon R5 or R6. Now after the recent update I decided to film the whole video which is linked up here in 4K 120 using autofocus the whole time and it was during the sunset and let me tell you what the autofocus performed great like I had no issues at all probably maybe even not even like once the autofocus went out and start jumping but again it was not like blue hour is more like sunset hour in this camera you can just set up the 180 degree rule and every time your camera would um, pretty much pick double the shutter speed that you don't have to calculate and do manually so for example if you shoot in, in 24 frames per second you don't have to manually scroll and do 148 every time you switch to let's say slow-mo 60 frames per second 120 you have to double the frame rate so 120 to 40 but this time you just click 180 degree rule it will just always do double the shutter for you and then you can compensate with ND filters this is probably the best uh, feature in this camera that I have and I love using is built-in ND filters with a click of a button you can just switch your ND filters up to 10 of them and this is such an easy tool to adjust your exposure. This is just great. I feel like every cinema camera should have that. I would actually be dying to try to switch to Sony to like FX3 if they had built-in filters. I know FX6 has it, but I just don't like the shape and form factor of the camera. I like form factor of FX3 or of C70. And I mean, you can use variable NDs on fr in front of the lens, but variable NDs, they make some color distortions, which I don't like. Some of them make vignette, and it's just pain in the butt because for every lens you have to switch it or you have to have step ranks and all that stuff. Here, the ND filters are in front of the lens, so you don't have to touch anything ever. Just press the button, you're good. Now, since we touched some slow motion features in this camera, I love using 4K 120 and 60. It is very eye pleasing. The codecs are very high, it's 10 bit all the way. The 4K 120 is a lot cleaner than on R5 because we know the R5 codec is a bit worse. And also, you get 180 frames per second slow motion, which is more than 120, so you can even slow down things even more but you will get a crop, I believe it's 2.7K and it's gonna be cropped into the sensor, which kind of sucks because all your lenses become even more cropped. And if you're using RF glass, which means you are already at 1.6 crop. So now it's gonna be at like double 1.6. So your 16 lens is gonna become like, I don't know, 40 or something, which kind of sucks. R6 Mark II actually came out with the 180 frame per second rate, but at um, 1080. And I've shot it, I've used it, Mm, I don't like it. I know Sony has uh, 240 frames per second, I believe, on an a7S 3 
but I've heard that it's not also a good codec as well and you just lose out a lot of detail. But that's if you're really into slow motion. Um, I do use slow motion a lot, but not as lot as I would use 24 frames per second. Actually lately I feel like 120 is a bit too much, so I've been using 60 a bit more, but it depends. It depends if you're trying to slow the water, let's say, on the ocean or the waves, I would do use 120, but let's say if it's just a B-roll of somebody doing something, I would probably use 60, depending on the activity. Other than ND filters, my biggest reason for the purchase of this camera was the dynamic range, and including the C-Log2 profile, well, now also the RAW. So, with the C-Log2, you get a lot more dynamic range, up to 16 stops, and man, you can push it. If you do know how to color grade, and if you don't, don't even try to purchase this camera, first learn how to color grade, because I've been there and I've done all these mistakes, and finally I'm getting to some point where I kind of like my image. By the way, this is recorded on the C70 with C-Log3. I decided not to push C-Log2 because I will have to work more with the, my um, settings and exposure corrections, so I'm just using C-Log3 and I'm still getting good enough dynamic range to have everything exposed good and I don't know, what do you guys think? I actually made my first custom LUT in DaVinci, I'm very happy about it. You guys let me know in the comments if you like it or not, I don't know, what do you think? But yeah, in some of the scenarios where you, let's say, would have to shoot the biggest, the easiest example probably would be inside of the car, where inside is dark, outside is bright. This camera actually performs very well, you can expose on the subject, on somebody who you shoot inside of the car for example, but outside the window it's still going to be clear and if you need to push down the highlights you can still drag them. Even if you're overexposed you still retain the information which is really great. Long story short, if you know how to color grade, the dynamic range on this camera is great. It does push the noise sometimes, especially if you shoot at night. This camera does get a bit noisier, so let's talk about low light. Low light on this camera is great, especially if you're using the RF to EF mount. I like using that, the adapter, because it not only becomes the full frame camera, but it also brings you one more stop of light. So for example, right now I'm shooting on a Sigma 35, 1.4, but I can step it down to 1.0. One extra light because the adapter allows me to. So because of that and low light, it kind of gives an advantage because now you can lower your ISO. But let's say if you do use RF native glass, like I have 7200, the only lens that I could buy, you will not be able to have that privilege. You will have to shoot at ISO 800 or more. And it does get noisier at like even 3200, 64 I would say is the push. I would not go more than that. I know on the R5 I'm able to go like even 12,800 ISO. By the way, I made a video on that as well. I'm gonna link it here as well. In Iceland, it was pushing all the way up there. I know it's not as good as Sony a7S III, but it's there. All I'm trying to say is that the noise on this camera is actually a bit worse than the R5. So you have to know what you're doing. Also, when I first purchased this camera, I thought you can only use the EF glass using the adapter they sell them for like 700 bucks. But no, you can actually use the regular RF to EF adapter they use for Canon R and R5 and everything will still work including autofocus. It's only 100 bucks, but it will not be full frame of course because it's just a hole. So pretty much you will still be able to use the EF glass, but it's gonna be super 35. One other thing that I really love about this camera is exposure tools. Finally, you're not limited to just the histogram and it will disappear as you start recording in the video. Surprisingly, R6 Mark II already has waveforms and R5 doesn't, but it still does disappear when you press record, so you can't monitor your video when you're recording. It is what it is, but I love having all the tools here. This camera also has two mini XLR ports and this is a great feature and of course being cinema camera this should have been included. The only downside it's a mini XLR but it's not a problem as you can buy the adapter. So it doesn't even have to be adapter, it can be just mini XLR on one side and XLR on, on the other side. So you have powered audio that can be recorded directly into your camera so you don't have to have a separate recorder. And man, First, I couldn't figure out, but I'm also making another video on just audio recording and how to use on Canon C70. This is super cool. You can actually connect two XLRs, two mini XLRs, and then you can also record another channel of audio. And you can separate all these audio channels into separate uh, layers. And also you can record, let's say, two levels of audio on one channel. So for example, with one Rode mic on top with XLR, you can record, let's say, 
minus 12 and then another one minus 15. Um, which means if I'm talking too loud in this audio peaks, you can use a separate backup track in that moment and then and keep using your primary main level of audio that you were not screaming or whatever. So that is really cool. You have like a safe track of audio and you can record all of those things at the same time. Um, talking about audio also in 120 and 4K, you can also record a separate track audio that can be recorded separately. And if you need slow more of that, you can also use because most of the Canon cameras, the mirrorless cameras don't record audio at all in 4K in slow-mo. Other than that, it has all the ports that you need, full HDMI, headphone jack. Um, you can also plug in power directly to the camera so you can even work it without the battery. The battery is also outside, which means you can hot swap them. Let's say if it's powered to the AC outlet, you can just take out one battery and put the new one in without even turning off the camera so you will not interrupt the recording process. So the main question is, who is this camera for? I would say this is a great run and gun camera for cinematographers, videographers who shoot weddings, documentary style videos, small budget video shoots, small commercials, nothing huge high end. But I've been using this camera actually for bigger projects. But I've had a lot of experience using this camera on a bunch of documentaries for Hey Bike. As you guys probably know if you watch this channel and if you don't, please subscribe. I would really appreciate and don't forget to leave the like since we're here. And I've been using this particular camera on this shoot and R5 was as a second cam and they match together pretty good. You would have to use a bit less saturation when you adjust your color, but pretty much the c 3 and c 2, they kind of go together, the colors match, but again, c 2 is not as saturated. So what I've been using, let's say if I do have my custom LUT, I would just have less intensity, intensity, I guess, intensity of uh, the LUT on uh, c 3, but more on c 2, because it does have a less saturation, less contrast and all that good stuff. But funny enough, uh, last year I actually shot a project for Rolls Royce. Somehow, I don't know how that happened. I can't tell you much more yet, but it is out there. I'm not actually the one who's editing the video, but I'm the one who shot the video. So all the raw videos were supplied by me. We shot it on this camera and the company was okay with that. Actually, that was part of their requirements. The camera had to be C-Log 2, at least 10 bit color and raw. So I was able to shoot it with this camera for a company like that. So there you have it. Take it or leave it. <laughs> well, I hope you guys enjoy this video. If I missed out on anything about this camera, I will be happily answering the comments below in the video. So please do not forget to leave those. Again, don't forget to subscribe and leave a like on this video. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time. Peace.